Mavens of motorsport, lovers of launches, caretakers of Cadillacs, it's podcast time. And you might be realizing that someone different is saying that today. And I'm realizing how hard it is for my co-host to come up with those every week. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, the usual motor uh, rambling about cars po- uh, co-host is a bit under the weather this week. Uh, Chris Smith, he's not feeling too well, but I've got someone else. Uh, he's not been on the podcast before, but he's a very, very, very familiar face around MotorOne.com. Anthony Allen is. Um, Anthony, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Do you want to just real quick t- tell everyone what you do at Motor One? Uh, contributing writer, you know, daily news writing. Yeah. Crunches every day. That's about, that's uh, that's what we do. Yeah. Just like Smith and I, you've been, how many years have you been with us offhand? Do you know? It's been uh, many. <laughs> four, three, four at this yeah, point. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, so real quick, and I forgot to tell you this before the show, all new uh, hosts or co-hosts in your case, um, uh, they have to go through a little bit of a quiz. So I've got a very brief quiz for you. You ready for that? All right. So what is your favorite car of the 1980s? Uh, the Toyota Tercel SR5. Wow. That, okay. I got to ask why. I haven't heard that one. Uh, I, I I found a video on YouTube about it, and I just kind of fell in love with its quirkiness. And little five-door hatchback, stick shift, uh, all-wheel drive Toyota with a little four-cylinder engine. I mean... It's just different. Okay. Yeah. Can't fight <laughs> you there. What's your favorite car of the 1990s? Uh, hmm. It's actually kind of, I don't think I've ever owned a car from the 90s. Uh, I don't know. I say maybe a Dodge Viper just because it was so revolutionary. Okay. What car or cars do you own right now? I have a 2013 Ford Mustang. Okay. Cool. And that's my daily. Oh, so you and Smith would have something to talk about if he was here. He has his uh, it's either 95 or 96 Mustang GT convertible that he's had for two, three years now, something like that. He's had it for quite a while, so or at least by his standards. But yeah. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, you get to pick one. Heated seats, heating st- heated steering wheel. Which are you going with? Heated seats. Heated seats. You're pushing the trend more and more in that direction. Early on, we had some heated steering wheel folks. As time goes on, the heated seats are taking over. We might have to phase out that question for something now. Um, But yeah, so as everyone can tell, we got a little bit something different today just because Smith's not here. Um, But Anthony, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to talk about cars with you. You write about cars every day just like me. So we're going to have some fun. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so just to start, uh, we've had quite a few debuts. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, we usually record this show in the early part of the week, even though it goes up in the later part of the week. Um, and Toyota has inundated us with debuts in the past few days. Um, we have several of our editors there who you'll see if you go on Motor One that we've got videos of live looks at a lot of these cars. But um, yeah, it's a it's been interesting time indeed. So first one we want to talk about is the North American debut for the new Toyota GT86 or GR86 as they call it now. I'm sorry. Um, you can see there uh, managing editor Brandon Turkus, who was on the show last week. Uh, we have a video up with him taking a look at it. Um, not much new, quote unquote. This is largely the vehicle that debuted in Japan um, a little bit ago, but Still interesting. You know, it's got the larger engine. It's now a 2.4 rather than a 2.0. That will allows power to increase to 228 horsepower. Uh, you get a six-speed manual or a six-speed six automatic. Um, and it's basically the same weight as the old one. It's, you know, it, 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 it lost weight or is about the same depending on what spec you're looking at. So pretty impressive. Anthony, what do you think of this guy? I really like it. I think it looks really good. A lot better than the uh, it's Subaru sibling, I think, especially in the front. Um, I think in Brandon's video, he said that uh, it kind of has like a Jaguar F type look to the front end. And I would agree. And I really I like it. That. I don't n- really like the the thin uh, uh, horizontal lights on some vehicles. And I think this mm-hmm. one really does better with those that go up over the fender a little bit. So uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, the image we're looking at now is from the side profile. And one of the I think the real striking things is how aggressive that uh, roof lip spoiler is or roof lip. I'm sorry. Trunk lid spoiler is Um, it's just 
it's really pointy. It looks really good. It really balances the uh, dimensions from front to rear. I, it's a good looking car. Um, yeah. I can see a little bit of like the Honda NSX in the rear, like uh, overhang, just the way that uh, big lip sticks up and kind of cuts down. Okay. I could, I kind I see what you're getting at there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sadly, we don't know price yet. We're kind of expecting it, I believe. Um, yeah, we're, we're expecting it to be around the same kind of 27 ish as the old one. That seems very likely. Um, but yeah, uh, what do you think? Uh, Anthony, would you buy one of these? Uh, I don't know if I would, I, I would not recommend anybody not buy it because it's a really great car. Yeah. Uh, but there's just so many good, I don't know if I pick it over Miata, to be honest. <laughs> I like the I, new design. I, I, I agree with you actually. Um, but I'm a Miata. I, I have never owned a convertible, but I want to own a convertible and that would kind of be enough to sway me towards the Miata. But like you said, I don't think this is a bad car in any way. It's just kind of, those two vehicles are competing in very much that kind of same entry level performance segment. And yeah, if it was my money, I'd go with the Miata, but I wouldn't look askance at anybody who picked one of these. No, of course not. I mean, uh, it does have a rear seat with the Miata doesn't have. Yeah. So if you, you need to haul around more than two people for whatever reason. Um. <laughs> yeah. If you got little kids, like I would never put an adult in the back of a 86, but if you got littler kids, they could fit back there. Oh yeah. And then they would definitely enjoy it too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So moving on, uh, we also got, and this is going to be a far more popular vehicle, um, the debut of the new Corolla Cross. Um, and for any of our YouTube watchers, you will be seeing that right about, oh, I lost it. There it is. Sorry, YouTube viewers. Um, and for any of our audio viewers, we'll be describing it. Um, so yeah, this is Toyota's new, basically their new entry level crossover. Um, there was a little bit of speculation when it first debuted, whether or not it was going to replace the CHR. Um, I know our guys kind of talked to some people from Toyota and it's not necessarily, at least not immediately going to replace the CHR. Um, so Anthony, what, what are your thoughts on the Corolla Cross? I think it's fine. I hate the name. Uh, I agree. <laughs> it's Yeah. I know what Toyota is trying to do with that name recognition, but I, I don't know, like what's the other one? The Eclipse Cross. Mm -hmm. It's just so corporate-y. <laughs> it's so obvious in a way. It's like, I understand why you would want to create, I mean, the Corolla is a huge selling vehicle. You mm -hmm. want to create that kind of connection to it. But if you look at this, it looks nothing like a Corolla. You, no. you know, there's nothing Corolla-ish about this vehicle's look. So kind of evoking it in the name is borderline pointless to me. I feel like they could have came up with something better, um, but I, I imagine the uh, corporate put their foot down on that naming. <laughs> yeah, I, I assume you're right. So in the U.S. at launch, we're going to get a two liter four cylinder making 169 horsepower and 150 pound feet of torque. We know that a hybrid version is going to come pretty soon afterwards, come later. Um, which isn't really surprising in a vehicle like this. The hybrid is probably going to be the one to get, in my opinion, um, just because you're going to get that extra fuel economy boost in a small vehicle. It just, it, to me, that makes sense. Anthony, do you think I'm, I mean, thoughts? I would get the hybrid uh, just for the, the efficiency and maybe you'll get a little oomph from the electric yeah. motors. Yeah. Um, that should make it a little bit more enjoyable to drive. To me, this thing looks kind of boring. Like, if if you had it, if you said you can either have a CHR or a Corolla Cross, I'm going to take the CHR every day. Um, but you know, I think there probably are people looking out out there looking for something that's a little bit more traditional, which is very much what this is. It, in a lot of ways, it looks like a baby Rav Four to me. Um, you can see it a lot in the rear uh, haunches, I think, uh, the rear fenders, the yeah. Rav Four uh, uh, influence. But I would, I would too, uh, pick the CHR if I had to choose between the two. But yeah, again, not, uh, like we were saying before with the eighty six, not a bad vehicle. Not you know, just maybe a little bit more. 
Toyota didn't take any chances when they kind of designed this. This is very much just right down the middle vehicle crossover design, but it is what it is. Uh, we're expecting the base model to start under $20,000 though, and then kind of higher at ones to go kind of mid high twenties. So it's going to be affordable. That's, you know, that's something in its favor. I mean, it's affordable. It's certainly practical. It's got totally. all the safe, you know, it's got the safety features. Efficient. It's it. It'll be a good car. It'll be a good crossover. Yeah, that. I mean, that's the one, or not not the one. That's one of the major things that is a selling factor for Toyota is that Toyota Safety Sense system. That mm -hmm. you know, we kind of talk about it in our Slack chat from time to time. There are high end vehicles like you know your Mercedes, your BMWs that don't come with the standard safety tech that a Corolla does or that this Corolla cross is going to. So, you know, it, it feels like the, at least those higher end cars, like before safety used to be like a plus added to, to those vehicles. I remember God, 10 years ago when Mercedes was pushing, it's like um, pre-collision warning or where mm -hmm. it was like prime the brakes and tighten the tension, in the seat belts and, and stuff like that. But with, you know, technology going the way it is and being, I would say like democratized across cars, uh, you know, luxury cars kind of lose that, I guess, zeal, that special sheen when, you know, a Honda fit has more standard safety features or a Corolla. Yeah. Yeah, what we kind of generally see is that that safety stuff, it debuts on the higher end stuff first. But then, I mean, if you look at the recent trends within, what, five years, seven years, something like that, it becomes, if not available, just a standard feature on lower end vehicles. And for the weird thing is, is that the luxury vehicles don't often change. They still continue to offer it as an option, even though your mainstream brands, your Ford, your Toyotas, your Hondas, whatever, it just right. becomes standard equipment. Yeah. Yep. It's it. Yeah. It's weird. So next up, talking about something a little bit more exciting, or at least in my opinion, a little bit more exciting than the Corolla Cross, we have got the Tacoma TRD Pro and Trail Editions that are coming. Um, so these are, you know, your kind of your rough and tumble special edition trucks. They look it, they, they're attractive. Well, I, you know, whatever you think of the Tacoma, but I would say these are good looking. I love the, like the highlighter yellow color on that Tacoma. Um, the, the kind of concrete gray, not my personal style, but not a bad looking vehicle either, but you know, it kind of cool. What do There's, you think? There's somebody around town with a new uh, Tacoma, and it looks really good on the road. And uh, it is actually this gray color uh, as well, um, which I'm not a fan of, but it doesn't look bad. It could be black or white, which would be worse. But uh, <laughs> um, it looks good. And I think, you know, both of these packages just enhance the design more so. I mean, yeah. it just makes it look tougher and certainly, I think, better than the competitors right now. So our guys actually took some pictures of the uh, TRD Pro and they got some like real world pictures of that color. And it's far less of like a highlighter yellow color in the real world. It's there's a lot more green to it. Um, it's pretty good, actually. Uh, yeah. Um, tell you what, why, can you talk about these just a second and I'll see if I can pull up that picture that our guys took to show it in the real world and show anyone who's watching on YouTube? Uh, yeah. Um, so they, I think these will be coming for what the 2022 yep. model year. Yep. 2022. Um, let's see. Uh, you get a suspension lift with the TRD pro, um, better approach and departure angles, which will be crucial for some, uh, off-roaders out there. Uh, let's see. More suspension travel, 16-inch black wheels with Goodyear all-terrain tires. Let's see. And the trail. You know, the trail edition also gets a uh, suspension lift um, and better departure and uh, approach angles. So you get the lunar rock color, which I think is that uh, that kind of concrete yeah. gray. And unfortunately, I cannot find the image that I'm thinking of right now. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, but it was worth oh, a look. No. But anyway, 
I, when we uh, do the post on Friday, I will include the picture that they took. It's there's a lot more green in it than the way it looks in the pictures. It's it's a pretty good looking. It's an interesting looking color. It's a very eye catching looking color. So I think Toyota lists it as army green. That, I that that doesn't look like any army green I've ever seen. But me neither. Um, sure. If if that's what they want to call it, why not? We also have super white and midnight. Mi- wow, midnight black metallic. Yeah, super white army green and midnight black metallic. I that must be army green, but again, that's not any army green I've ever seen. I don't know yeah. any army that it's rolling through the de- through the forest in that color. But whatever Toyota want to call it, it's fine. Right. So uh, once again, moving on, and again, Toyota, you're doing something interesting here in that you are debuting a ton of vehicles basically all at once. And I wonder about that strategy because I wonder how many of these people aren't paying attention to simply because there are so many. Um, It always kind of boggles my mind when automakers do that, that they decide that rather than you know, kind of splitting stuff up week after week that they put everything out at once. I don't love it personally, just because I don't feel as though everyone's going to see all of these where, if you know, Toyota had a debut on every Monday of the month of June or whatever, maybe they'd get some more attention, but I'm not a marketing guy. I'm not a PR guy. Maybe they know better than me. I wonder if some of the stuff got backed up with COVID. That's you know? probably true. Yeah. You know, a few a few things got delayed, probably. Yep. So next up, the Toyota Supra A91 CF edition, CF standing for carbon fiber. Um, and so, yeah, you're getting a the new Supra with a bunch of carbon fiber parts on, on it. And I mean, it looks like a Supra with a carbon fiber body kit. It's nothing especially, I guess, special, but you do get carbon fiber bits for the front splitter, the side rocker panels, the canards, uh, the rear, and they made the rear spoiler taller. So, sure. I, I mean, you're getting what's advertised and you can't beat that. Yeah, it's it's called the carbon fiber edition. <laughs> They're giving you carbon fiber. Sure, we'll take it. You also get 19 inch wheels with a, a matte black finish. It's It's a Supra. It's fine. I don't know if this is necessarily going to make people run out to the dealers to get one, but it's limited to 600 cars, so they'll sell all 600. Oh, yeah. They'll find buyers for it. Um, it, look, it looks good. I mean, it, Yeah, it looks <laughs> fine. It's, you know, this is one of the ones I think is going to fall through the cracks just because it's it's a factory offered body kit on a Supra. It, it's not much more than that. <laughs> yep. You got anything to add other than I mean, I mean, there's really not much to add. It's just super with a, you know, carbon fiber, you know, goodies. Yeah. And, you know, they're only making 600 of them, so they'll sell those. But it's it it is what it is. Um, And then so next up, this is kind of the future of Toyota. And it's technically a concept, although um, Toyota announced that the production version is going to debut later this year and it's going to go on sale next year. So this is the BZ4X, which is a terrible name for a vehicle because no one's going to remember that. But it is Toyota's um, electric crossover. Uh, they say it's about the size of a RAV4. Um, we don't know much about the powertrain yet, but they say it uses a Toyota, or I'm sorry, a Subaru co-developed all-wheel drive system. So based on that, we would suspect that it's a two-motor um, EV. You don't usually get an EV where the front motor is also driving the rear wheels. It, it's possible. It's just not likely. Mm-hmm. Um And yeah, uh, again, we don't know much about range yet. The thing is, we are fairly certain that the production version is going to look, if not identical, very, very similar to this. Um, uh, Especially if you look at the interior photos, which for our YouTube viewers, you're going to be able to see now. It's a production ready interior. It looks like a vehicle that could go on sale immediately. Um, you know, so you've got a uh, a digital instrument cluster with it, it's kind of an interesting design. It kind of sits inside of a gutter uh, in the dashboard, which I suspect is for glare reasons. When you put it like that, it's kind of got wings on either side of it that's going to protect protect it from glare. Uh, you've got a widescreen infotainment system. You've got digital displays for the HVAC system. You've got a really big touch uh, pad on the center console. You know it. 
none of this looks like stuff that couldn't go into production immediately. And I won't be too surprised if later in the year when we see this, it looks damn near identical. Um, have you looked at the BZ4X before this, Anthony? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I uh, there's a, I think, photo lower down in the story that it's sitting like a, a teal background and it looks... Sure. Like ready for number one, ready for production, but it looks like it looks good. Um, I don't know how I feel about the black um, around the front fender, like that mm-hmm. glossy black. Um, maybe that's the concepty part of the vehicle that they, yeah, that could easily of. be, you know, uh, get re- gotten rid of. Um, that's before. an easy thing to change. Yeah, but I mean, it looks like a electric crossover. I mean. <laughs> There's only so yeah. many ways to slice it. The thing is, that's not something Toyota has right now. So this is that is you know, true. The, this is going to be their entry level into, or their not their entry level, but their entry into that. One of the interesting things is in those photos that you're talking about, and these are the earlier photos of the concept, is that it some of them it has this yoke steering wheel. Um and some of them it doesn't, and especially in the newer photos, it doesn't. So I don't know if the yoke steering wheel, if it's going to be an option, if it's going to be something only for certain markets, or if it's just something purely only for the concept. And they're like, here's what it could look like that way, or here's what it could look like with the traditional steering wheel. I, I think the yokes always look dumb, but, you know. I mean, it it is because, you know, when you turn to turn a corner you know you go you go to reach for that other uh part of the wheel to bring it back or whatnot and you you're, there's nothing there right um though was it the model s earlier this year had yeah. a, what, a yoke too maybe it's just a trend <laughs> yeah maybe it's just a, but again this is the concept we're looking at maybe it's just something for the concept we right. don't really know right now i I would be shocked if Toyota op- offers it with the yoke steering wheel, especially when they're showing it with a traditional round steering wheel. Um, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, Toyota's not Tesla and trying new things like that. <laughs> no, 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 they're not. And the other thing that's worth mentioning is that this is co-developed with Subaru, and Subaru is going to get their own version of this called the Saltera. Um, the Saltera will debut in mid-2022 rather than this in early 2022. Um, on YouTube, we're looking at the uh, the teaser images for the Saltera now, and you can see it looks basically the same. It's going to have a Subaru front end, but... I'm expecting the mechanicals to be identical with just some styling changes. Um, I mean, for, it would be, it would be easier if just, you know, Toyota or finished taking over Subaru. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, it totally would be. That's something I've been saying for years is that at this point, uh, Toyota, it's either 20 or 25% they own of Subaru. Mm-hmm. They should just buy the rest and get it over with. Cause you know, you've got, we were just talking about the 86, you've got the right. BRZ, this and the uh, BZ, BZ4X, like it's, it's clearly the future that at some point Toyota is going to own Subaru. And I, at this point, it should just be sooner rather than later. But, right. It's, it's not like they're not going to continue working together as, no. you know, the auto industry, you know, goes towards electrification and all that right. other, other stuff. It just makes sense to work together. Yep. And so our last Toyota to talk about, and that is a new uh, special edition of the Forerunner. Um, and that is the TRD Sport trim, which we have to differentiate from the TRD Pro trim. Um, th- the way they're differentiating it is TRD Sport is more of a road focused um, uh, special edition. TRD Pro is more of an off road focused special edition. Um, so, yeah. So, uh you're basically getting things that's going to make it a little bit more comfortable on the road, but still with that kind of aggressive look, you've got a different hood, 20 inch wheels, roof rails with a gloss back gloss black finish. Um, it's tweak suspension, you know, not a lot, but for someone who is basically not intending to go off road, maybe they might look at this and be like, I, I want a forerunner that looks a little bit different and I'm not going to take it off road. So this is the forerunner for me. Thoughts. I mean, it looks fine. I mean, it's, yeah. it's you know, um, it's a large SUV that's trying to be a little tougher than maybe what it, it actually is. I mean, it's supposed to split between the uh, SR five model and the 
TRD off-road one. And that's not a big space to fill. There's only a $4,000 difference between those two models. Mm-hmm. So it feels like maybe they're threading the needle a little bit on trying to get some uh, some people to spend a little bit more money. But Yeah. So going back to what we were kind of talking about earlier, what do you think about Toyota's strategy here to kind of put all of these debuts out within two or three days? You know, uh, neither one of us are in PR marketing or anything like that, (laughs) but we have written about cars long enough to have an opinion on it. Do you agree with me that it just seems like a lot in a very little time? It it does seem like a lot because I I had forgotten all about the uh, the Supra. Like that one oh. falling through the cracks. Uh, yeah. um, and certainly other, you know, people who aren't as tuned in will certainly miss some of this stuff too. Um, it would seem like if they spread it out over, you know, mid May through mid June, they would have had a better. Uh, yeah. If they just did one a week for a yeah. lot of these, I, mm-hmm. I feel like they would get a lot more kind of bandwidth on each one. Whereas they, you know, put everything out in two or three days and, I think, yeah, people are going to forget about the Supra. People are going to forget about the Forerunner. Maybe forget about the the Tacoma, although they look a little bit better. But yeah, especially when Toyota is, you know, introducing the, their first EV concept. Mm-hmm. You know that that should have taken like maybe a little bit more weight. Yeah. Well, we saw it earlier. I believe oh, it was yeah. either in China or Japan that he debuted it. But this was the first North American showing, and it was the confirmation that the production version we're going to see it later in the year and then it'll be on sale next year which is still a big deal like right i mean it's it's one thing to you know show a concept that's coming eventually but to right. have the concept with you know dates and targets and uh you know goals that's that's yeah. another step totally so we have just a few minutes left in this first segment. So since we got the time, we might as well mention it. We also saw BMW, like just about every automaker, is getting super serious about EVs. And so we got North American information about the i4 and the iX. And for anyone curious, the i4 is the, their new electric four-door sedan. I know you would expect it to be called the i3, but they already had one of those. They called it the i4. And the i IX is their upcoming electric crossover. Um, I4, it's going to launch with two versions. You're going to be able to get the E-Drive 40, which is a single motor in the rear with 335 horsepower, 317 pound-feet of torque, and an estimated range of 300 miles. The M50 uses exactly the same battery pack, but has two motors for a total of 536 horsepower, Unfortunately, since you have the same battery, more power, estimated range falls to 245 miles. So that kind of that, that seems like a lot of compromise to me. But let me get through this, Anthony, and then you and I can <laughs> kind of discuss that. Um, the iX, on the other hand, has a massive battery. It The battery capacity is 111.5 kilowatts, which is huge. And 106.3 kilowatt hours of that is usable. So that. That's a mighty big battery. Um, estimated range, though, is still only 300 miles, which from a battery that big, you would I would expect more. But, you know, weight and things like that kind of come into play. It's probably pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's got to be big. But, you know, it is what it is. So anyway, your thoughts on the i4 and the iX? I think the i4 is where it needs to be, uh, especially mm-hmm. with the uh, the E-Drive 40. I think that'll entice a lot of people with that 300 miles of range. I think people who are willing to compromise um, for more performance are probably okay with the less, less having less range. Um, 245 Still, miles. But when you're thinking about like a Tesla Model S or something like that, they're getting over 300. Oh, yeah, that's true. You know, like they're getting a lot more range for... N- I think more power, the same. So BMW is estimated, estimating that the M50 is going to do 62 and 3.9 seconds. What a uh, model S plaid is doing it in like threes to mid twos. You're right. I guess when you, when you compare I mean, why uh, comparing things to Tesla is so difficult because yeah, uh, it is such an outlier from yeah. what, at least from what the mainstream brands are offering um, in terms of, I mean, Porsche couldn't, uh, you know, match Tesla mm-hmm. with its range. Um, it just seems like there's a big discrepancy for some reason. 
I, I guess the other thing is that this is the starting point. You know, Tesla has been around for a while. A lot of EV brands have been a, around for a while, you know, and BMW, they certainly dip their toe in things with the i3 and the i8. They have the iX3 now, but, you know, they're still kind of, they're new to this. So, you know, you got to start somewhere. I right. don't think this is a bad place to start, but the numbers are still maybe a bit disappointing. I guess a little bit, yeah. I wonder where BMW would be if they went a little, you know, a little harder with EVs a decade ago, mm -hmm. and, and really kept their foot, you know, pressed into it. Yep. And real quick before we move on, uh, BMW also confirmed, and this was a rumor before, there's going to be an iX, which is the crossover version M60, which will have over 600 horsepower. Um, so I'll be curious. I'll want, I wonder if it'll be like the I4 and it uses the same battery. So you have to sacrifice range or I wonder if they're, you know, if things will be different. I'll be curious, but yeah, we'll find out. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So, um, everyone, uh, we always appreciate you listening. Um, sorry, Smith can't be here again. He's just, not feeling well. Um, looking at the comments from last week's show about uh, kind of talking about overrated and underrated cars, a lot of people were upset with his thoughts that the Supra was overrated and say he and said he was saying that simply for controversy. <laughs> um, we've talked about that in our chat. I can tell you that he was not saying that simply to be controversial in any way. That those are his feelings. Um, I'll let him kind of explain further next time he's on. Anthony, since you're here, what what are your uh, A80 Supra thoughts, pre fourth gen Supra thoughts? Do you have any feelings on them? Uh, or do you not want to gain the ire of the people like he did? <laughs> I, I, it's not that I don't feel right judging whether a car's overrated or underrated. Okay. Um, it, it's, I, I don't know if it matters. Okay. As long as people who enjoy it enjoy it. I don't know, maybe because I'm getting older. Um, <laughs> the the hot takes aren't as hot as they used to be. <laughs> uh, people like what they like. You can't complain with that. Cool. Well, uh, real quick, I do want to read two emails that we received. Um, let me see. Yeah. Okay. I, sorry. I had to double check things. Wanted to read this one first. Um, so as always, we don't read names just in case people want to retain their privacy. Um, so, hey guys, I'm sending you this email for two reasons. The first one is because I wanted to thank you for restarting the podcast. I've been searching for quite some time for a good car podcast that is also fun to listen to. And I came across yours by mistake. Thanks. <laughs> More specifically, I was looking for news on the new Supra and stumbled upon your latest episode, which I thoroughly enjoyed listening to. So he must not have thought we were too crazy or Smith was too crazy by saying the Supra was overrated. Right now, I am listening to your older episodes. The second reason for my email is a question. I went through the titles and descriptions of your older podcasts, and I couldn't find any discussion of Alfa Romeo. As you already know, Stellantis CEO Carlos Tavares announced that Alfa Romeo, along with Lancia and DS, will be given 10 years to prove their worth. Alfa has announced mostly crossovers and SUVs coming in the near future, while their CEO is dreaming of bringing back a sports car. My question to you is this. If you were Alfa Romeo's CEO, what would you do to return the brand to profitability while appearing while appealing to the enthusiast crowd? Thanks again for the podcast and for reading my email. So I appreciate you for listening. I am actually not going to uh, answer your question right now because when Smith comes back next week, I want us to kind of dedicate a segment to that because I think we'll have some fun ideas. So just wait. I'll be getting to you. So second email. I think it would be cool if Bruce Smith and maybe a special guest, he suggests Angel, uh, who is another one of the Motor One writers. Unfortunately, Angel does not live in the United States. So getting him on the podcast is a bit of a timing challenge. Um, but wait, I've got something on that too, uh, made a podcast episode about which cars you would buy if you somehow inherited $1 million. Also, rambling about cars is hands down the best podcast in the world. It's not, but I thank you for thinking that. And I'm telling all my car interested friends about it. Keep it going. So we don't have Ongo, but we do have an Anthony. So 
For our second topic this week, we will be talking about what we would buy if we inherited $1 million. Sound good, Anthony? Uh, it's far easier said than done, but let's do it. You know what? I had the same problem. <laughs> I had the, um, would you like to go first or would you like me to go first? Uh, I can I can start. Uh, okay. How about, you know what? Let's do this. We hadn't talked about this before. Why don't we go back and forth? You pick one. I pick one. Or no, I guess for the math reasons, that doesn't make sense. You go first and then I'll go. We'll see where we get to. Uh, yeah. uh, it's easy to want like, uh, you know, a Ferrari or a McLaren. Or I mean, with a million dollars, you could get four ish. You could, yeah. yeah. Those. Uh, maybe I'm going from a more practical standpoint and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, day to day, realistically. Um, exactly. But for sure, I would pick the, the Cayman GT4. Okay. You're it's, only at like a hundred grand. So you've I know, got, <laughs> I know I got a lot left. Um, you've got a lot left. <laughs> But uh, I, I really in, love that car. I love its performance. I love how it's its really a driver's car. I feel like mm-hmm. it would be something that you could drive uh, regularly and enjoy without um, hating yourself in terms of trying to crawl out of it or your back pain or, or any other things that come with you know a high-end supercar. Uh, Anthony, I think you and I are going to get along really well on this. <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, don't get me wrong. Going fast is fun. Um, a GT4 RS is fast, or GT4 RS is coming. But yeah, GT4 I mean, is fun. It, yeah, I mean, it's it's right in the, I guess, sweet spot that I I, I that I have for myself on, on what would be fun to drive. Because you get, you know, uh, a McLaren or something. That's a lot of power to handle on a daily basis. Not that I don't mm-hmm. trust myself, but um, if I'm going to push it on the back roads, you know, and the curvy roads, which one would be... Uh, less likely to draw attention. <laughs> sure, totally. Um, also in the garage, I guess if we're if I can take pick another one here, it would be of course. Yeah, my, you, know, my, you go and then I'll go. I think that's probably just for <laughs> to get to the it, for the math reasons. It's gonna right. be right here. <laughs> uh, my my daily driver would be a uh, uh, AMG E sixty three wagon. That'd okay, be the, the, the yeah. family car. Um. Of course, completely specked out because, uh, you know, there's a million dollars to spend. So why not make it the right. best, best one available? Maybe get some, you know, got to leave some money for some aftermarket too, you know. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I was looking at this. I think specked up, you're looking at like 160-ish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're at 260-ish. Yeah. So uh, you've still got a ways to go. Well, you, I know. You're, you're a quarter. Qu- you're, yeah. I, you've I, spent a quarter and you still have three quarters of your money left. Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to be able to spend it all, to be honest. Um, I would also have a Toyota Tercel SR5. I would make sure I have one. And it's like the best one that I could get. So that's like. So you spent $10,000. Yep. <laughs> um, also, I would probably throw in an Audi RS G, uh, e-tron GT. I need an oh, electric vehicle. That's an interesting pick. I, I like the styling more than the the Taken. Um, mm-hmm. I think the Audi just looks better, and I want an EV in my garage. <laughs> so, just real quick uh, for our YouTube viewers, is this the Tercel you're thinking of? Right there. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Cool. Okay. For anyone, for our non YouTube viewers, we are looking at a picture of a red Tercel wagon. It's got skis on the roof. It's the SR5. It's got a giant rear hatch that you can load up with stuff, and it's on the snow. So, yeah, um, there's an old, uh, I think, Motor Week review of it and how it just kept on trudging along in the weather, the winter weather that they had. Yeah, because they recorded like Maryland, and with yeah. those skinny tires, all wheel drive, that thing would just eat up the snow. Yep. Uh, I, I like cars like that. I agree. Um, and also in the garage would be some sort of vintage Mustang, something from 64 through 68. Ooh, cool. Um, I fell in love with those. those. That was the first car I fell in love with back in the day. My mom had a 73 Mach 1 when she mm-hmm. was uh, younger, and she worked at Ford and fell in love with Mustangs when she, I found out she had one. But I would pick something from there, and I would maybe convert it to an EV as well. Oh, wow. That's an interesting thought. I mean, EV is the future. I like it's you get the better, you know, perf- the torque and, and range doesn't uh, the limits of range don't bother me that much. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
if it only had a hundred and yeah, like that, if I only had 150 miles or 175 miles, that'd be plenty. I don't, that that's from where I live to Detroit and back with mileage left over. I mean, that's <laughs> plenty. So just, do you know, I, the number I have in my head for a super nice one of those before any work on it, like 50, does that seem, I have no idea at this point. It's actually been a while since I looked, uh, I don't know. I mean, I have X amount of money left over in my inheritance. So whatever it took. <laughs> yeah, hey, you have a ton um, of money. You have, like, yeah. I think you have like seven thirty or so. So yeah, you're fine. <laughs> we'll have uh, quite a bit left, but I, I don't, I don't think I could spend it all. I really don't. So uh, are you all done or do you have any more? Cause I, I I'm I, fairly done. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I got to be honest with you. I ran into the exact same problem that you did in that uh, um, I figured out what I wanted and then I had $500,000 left. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I I will share with you as I go. And so what I did was I actually found vehicles for sale either on just wherever, bring a trailer, cars and bids, um, RM Sotheby's, stuff like that. So these are the prices that they actually sold for, you know, whatever. So my expensive one, like here's the daily driver where I really want to have a whole hell of a lot of fun is a uh, 2018. Um, here, let me get this up. It, it is a 2018 Porsche 911 Turbo exclusive. Um, and so that is the one that has the carbon fiber stripes or so they, they peel the paint off, they strip the paint off. So you can see the carbon fiber in the roof and the hood and everything. Um, this one is currently on bring a trailer. It ends in five days. Current bid is $205,000. Um, so that's the expensive one, but you know, if you're going to go, go big, why not? Right. Uh, so, so that was kind of my, That's the one I would want to drive kind of every day. It's special, but it's still, you know, it's a Porsche. I'm a Porsche guy. I, it just, it kind of is what it is. We we had this conversation last week where whether or not 911s are special enough to be on a concourse, which Porsches are special enough to be on a concourse. I like Porsches over a lot of the Italian stuff. I don't know necessarily why it, that's just me. So 205 grand out of the way, assuming it sells for that. But right. <laughs> for my, for this reason, I'm going to assume that it does. Uh, next one, I have to buy something for my wife because if I didn't, she would kill me. So um, let's hope this loads. If it doesn't, we'll just use a generic picture. It's not going to load for me. Anyway, so a Mercedes Benz. So we, she and I were actually talking about this over the weekend while we were driving around to her, a Mercedes Benz is still kind of the epitome of luxury that, you know, kind of when she grew up, that's what it was. Um, and so we currently have a Subaru Outback that she loves. So what's the closest Mercedes to a Subaru Outback, an E-class all-terrain wagon. You still got that lifted wagon thing. They start at 68. I went through and kind of specced one the way I think she would spec one. It ended up being just kind of kissing 90 grand, which for her and I, she could drive it to work every day. Her and I could take it on road trips a lot easier than we could take the Porsche. Our dog could fit in the back and everyone would be super comfortable and it would be fast and it would still be a fun car. So so I'm at right around 290. And then I was looking on bring a trailer and that's always dangerous. And <laughs> I found, so I need a convertible now, you know, I've got the, the fast coupe. I've got the family car. I need a convertible, right? So here, stop that screen. Here we go. Alfa Romeo Duetto Spider, 1967. Current bid on this one is just 17 grand, which just seems stupid affordable for, it's got that Alfa Romeo twin cam engine, which I don't know if you've ever heard one, but 
it to me it might be the best sounding engine in the world it's certainly up there it's got that kind of gorgeous flowing line you can pretend you're um uh dustin hoffman and the graduate when you're driving it <laughs> like i i don't know if you could ever not listen to simon and garfunkel while you were driving this thing and it's gorgeous and if i got a million dollars 17 grand is nothing let's say it goes for 25 grand i could still afford it all day long like it's just you, you know could afford two exactly <laughs> you know but, but just real quick, have you heard? Have you ever heard? You know the Alfa Romeo twin cam four cylinder. Not, not that I can recall now. <laughs> oh, dude, it's just, oh. it's the best sound in the world. They just sound so good, especially for that era. Okay, so again, bring a trailer is a dangerous place. It's dangerous. You shouldn't go there. And so, for eight thousand dollars eight thousand dollars i could afford that literally right now with three days to go uh a lancia scorpion and so our european listeners won't know what i'm talking about so this was um oh i forget what it was called in europe but we're talking mid-engine four-cylinder transverse rear wheel drive I've always liked these. They did use them for rallying in Europe. It's just an attractive, it kind of looks like a DeLorean that someone took a Salzal to and cut off the front and rear. And they're affordable and they're Italian and they're cool. And I've got a million dollars to spend. So eight grand is nothing. So yeah. And then I realized that this won't end unless I buy something truly expensive because <laughs> I like cheap, fun cars. It's always what I've loved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I had to find something dumb and expensive that I would buy, look at, probably never drive. And, um, oh, where is it? Okay, so here we go. Here's my dumb, I'll probably never drive it car. I'll just share the whole screen. It is a Jaguar XJ220. Like, why not? Right. If, I, if I've got the money, why not? <laughs> um, th I, these cars were featured in video games when I was young. There's a really interesting XJ220 video game for any of our viewers, if you want to look it up. It was on the Sega CD. I believe it's on the Amiga. Um, yeah, they're just... The 220 was supposed to be... It was supposed to be able to go 220 miles an hour. I don't think it ever did, but... It was certainly a, uh, capable of hitting like the 190, 200 range. And they're just gorgeous and cool. And it's not a Ferrari. It's not a Lamborghini. It's not one you would ever expect. And it's gorgeous. It, it would turn heads at the, you know, uh, Cars and Coffee for sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't care about those people, though, because I just like I've got a million dollars and somehow I've got a place to store all these cars, which is the reason I don't have a fun car right now, because I don't have a place to put it. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, I had one other one real quick. Oh, okay. So for any of our viewers, um, so you probably know of Icon, Icon 4x4. They make the really cool custom uh, uh, Broncos and FJ40s and things like that. And of course, the images aren't loading on this one. But, oh, there we go. Um, so before that, the guy that ran, runs that company, Jonathan Ward, he still has this company called TLC 4x4, and they specialize in doing Toyota Land Cruisers, hence TLC. Um, and so you can get an FJ80, which is kind of a 90s-ish Land Cruiser, but with all the upgrades you could ever want. So the one I'm looking at now has a 6.2 liter LS V8 in it, which is, you know, a ton bigger than was ever offered, <laughs> but they're all made to order. So maybe I wouldn't get like the big snorkel and stuff like that. I wouldn't go quite that big, but I would love to have one of these. Basically have a Land Cruiser with all the modern amenities, have it look, you know, have it moderately lifted like the one we're looking at here, have, you know, just all that that capability and look and whatever. Thing is, Jonathan Ward stuff's not cheap. I've never seen a price for one of these. I'm guessing it's 150 to 200 just as a guess, just judging from his other stuff. And so, yeah. Um 
Yeah. And I'm not even at a million yet. I do have some other ones, but we are actually running out of time. <laughs> um, so I could actually fill them out. But yeah. Uh, Anthony, quite, any thoughts on my picks? It's quite a garage. It's an eclectic garage. And you, you can't uh, fault yourself for what you like. Yeah, it's, you know, that's kind of the thing is that everyone likes their own thing. That's kind of the beauty of this million dollar garage thing is that you get to dream because I don't know. I don't think I know anyone that just wants to buy one million dollar car. Like to me, that's kind of a waste. That's one car in your garage that you can use sometimes. Right. Whereas with a million dollars, like if you look around, you can buy damn near anything. Like, sure, there's some Ferraris, there's some Mercedes, Lamborghinis that you're not going to be not going to be able to get. But there, as far as I know, there aren't very many million dollar Japanese cars out there. There are a handful, your Hemi Kuda convertible, stuff like that, million dollar American cars. There's just a ton of stuff out there. You could fill a garage full of cool stuff if you, you could- had that money. You could fill the garage, and I think the million dollars gives you the freedom to try a variety of cars that you wouldn't yeah. be able to otherwise. And to to blow, I don't want to say blow it, but to spend it on one or two, uh, it feels like you're depriving yourself of a lot of experiences with yeah. some cool, quirky cars that you know are one year old or a hundred years old. Exactly. Yeah. Imagine having like, you know, a Duesenberg or right. you know, a V16 Cadillac or stuff like that, that, you know, you just never see. Yeah, yeah. Anything, yeah. it just gives you an opportunity to, to experience life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Anthony, do you have anything? Do you have any social medias you want to plug? Instagram, Twitter, what, whatever. I mean, Instagram, Twitter, you follow and find me by my name, Anthony Alanis. Um, okay. I'll show up. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, uh, I am Chris Bruce 1985 on Twitter. You can always find us on motor one.com Anthony and I, if you want to send anything to the podcast, uh, tell Chris Smith to get better soon. Um, <laughs> you can do that at uh, podcast at motor one.com. Um, and yeah, so as always, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Whenever you happen to be listening to this, we always appreciate you listening. Um, we love your comments. We love reading your comments. We love your emails. You know, it, it, Smith and I do this as a labor of love, trust me. And so we love hearing from you, whether you think we're a bunch of idiots that are just doing this to raise controversy or whether you're telling us that you love us and asking us questions. It's... Honestly, it's kind of all the same. So <laughs> we appreciate it. And thank you very much. And Anthony, thank you for filling in kind of short notice. I know it was difficult, but I appreciate it. So thank, thank you, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>